We just watched the Bills and Josh Allen, who looked fantastic, take down the Baker Mayfield. Still sounds a little weird. Buccaneers, who have lost three straight. We will dive into that. As well as some teams with a lot on the line over the next uh, Sunday and Monday. We might be talking blow it up around the trade deadline. Some pressure on some NFL quarterbacks this weekend. And the Harbaugh story keeps getting weirder. And, of course, we'll do the bold take of the week. But first, subscribe to the podcast wherever you may listen. Three and out with me, John Middlecoff, Apple, Spotify. We got you covered every single platform. You watch this on YouTube, hammer that like button, subscribe to the page, leave a comment below in the description, and uh, share it with your friends and probably your enemies too. Everyone you know, send it out. And last but not least, thevolume.com, thevolume.com. We got hats, thevolume.com, three and out, flex fit, trucker hats. Go check that out right now. And before we dive into a lot of football talk, game time, grab your smartphone and download the fastest growing ticketing app, which happens to be the official ticketing app of this podcast, Game Time. You want to go to an NFL game, you want to go to a college basketball game, you want to go to a concert, you want to go to a comedy show and laugh, put your feet up, have a good time, have some beers, do it on me. Promo code John, when you sign up for your first pair of tickets, have interactive ticketing maps. On the, on the app, you can see where you're sitting, the sight lines, the price points. Cannot recommend them enough. Love my friends at Game Time. Been using them all year long. Go do it and do it now. Download the Game Time app. Promo code John, $20 off. I don't even need a thank you. Just hammer that promo code, promo code John. Okay, the Bills, the score is a lot closer than what we just witnessed, and we will start with them. They're 5-3, and three and they've had a bizarre season. They've had some high highs and some low lows. I think big picture, clearly, when their quarterback is on, they are really good. He is a very, very special player. Tonight, as the kids would say, he was in his bag. He looked freaking excellent. He dominated that game. Uh, honestly, the box score doesn't do him justice because the pick was pretty freakish. Great play by Winfield. But Josh Allen was brilliant from the jump tonight. He came out, honestly, the Bills felt like an NBA team with a top five NBA player that just said, I'm going off. You're not stopping me. I'm carrying us to the promised land on this Thursday night game, especially after a terrible divisional loss last week. But here's what I asked myself with the Bills. They're all in on this team, right? And some things have not gone well for them. Given the injuries, they've lost several impact defensive starters. Last year, they make the acquisition for Vaughn Miller, tears his ACL, love the guy. Have a lot of admiration for Von Miller. One of the biggest bets I've ever made came in the Super Bowl where he was the MVP. He'll always have a special place in my heart, but he's just not the same guy. He's really not. So they need help, and I think they are a clear team. One of the teams who views themselves, fair or not, as a Super Bowl contender, as someone who's going to be sniffing around some and go big game hunting over these next couple days. And to me, it would not shock me on Monday or Tuesday if they get very aggressive, you know, aggressive like trading a first-round pick for a very highly impactful player. Clearly on defense, they could use help. Defensive line, you can never have enough of them. Offensively, it feels like the Bills, you know, have a lot of firepower in the passing game. When when Davis is playing like this, obviously Diggs is an elite player, and the young dude from Boise State, 10, uh, is good. I like him a lot. Cook has his moments, and obviously Josh Allen can run around. You could always use another weapon, but to me, defense is where you win championships, and uh, I think they're going to be sniffing around some big-time guys. Be willing to give a first-round pick. They're already all in. You're paying the quarterback this much. He's in the prime of his career. Uh, Both the GM and the coach now have been together for a long time. You're so close. You're right there. You know, you've competed. You've dominated your division. Uh, you know, the only way to get over the hump, like this team's probably not good enough. Now you add a piece. I'm not even saying they're one player away, but they don't have many other options at this point in time in the season, but to try to add a big time player. And and I kind of expect them, depending on who truly is available, you know, come Sunday, Monday, and we'll find out more as teams lose on Sunday, is for the Bills to be a major, major player in, in the trade market. And speaking of a team who should wait, because to me, the Bills, if your quarterback gets really hot, and last year, I think a lot of people make excuses for them. 
at the end of the season, everything that would happen to them in terms of being displaced with the uh, the blizzard, what happened to DeMar, uh, and, and the way the season ended, let's face it, was pretty embarrassing against the Bengals. But a lot of people internally somewhat defended it. Now, and I know you've had some adversity, you've lost some guys, but how, you know, you got a quarterback in the peak of his powers. You got to do everything humanly possible to give yourself the best chance. The cards you have right now are are just, it is what it is, but you can't add. And to me, a first round pick for a high end player should be something they're all over. When it comes to the Bucs, listen, Jason Light, several years ago, landing Tom Brady, changed his resume, changed this franchise resume forever. It was incredible, and it worked. It's over. Like like this group of older veteran guys, I know their record. It, it's not like they're one and six, right? They are three and four. They've lost three three straight games. And honestly, before that, kind of lucky touchdown, one of the worst drives you'll ever see toward the end of the game. It took like 25 minutes. They got them that extra touchdown, and then the two-point conversion, which was pretty lucky. This team was struggling to score 10 points for three straight games. This offense isn't good. And listen, I I actually think he's resurrected his career a little bit, Baker Mayfield, but he's not a starting quarterback. He's a guy on your NFL team, really good backup, can come in in a pinch, get for a couple million dollars, and if you need him to play, you can win a game. But when he has to play over and over and over again, he's just not that good. And every time they talk about him on a broadcast, what are the for the swagger, the intensity, and all that stuff matters. But ultimately, you also need the talent, as you saw today with the Buffalo Bills. He he just doesn't have it. And there were passes flying all over the place tonight. Uh, I, if I'm the Bucks, I'm basically making every player on my team available, beside a couple. And even then, you know the Wurfs, the Winfields, make me an offer that's going to be very very hard for me to refuse. But the Godwins. The Evans, for sure. Uh, I know Vita Vea was enacted the night, but I would definitely listen. Devin White, th- th- there is not any veteran player at this point in time that I wouldn't think about detonating this thing, blowing it up, and starting all over next year. And then the big picture question is Todd Bowles. And he's long been known as one of the best defensive coordinators in the NFL, and I agree. He- he's an excellent defensive coordinator when he just gets to be the number two. Sometimes when you get to be the number one, your strength as a coordinator is immediately diminished. We've seen that with Brandon Staley. His one year with the Rams, when he didn't have to focus on the macro view of the team, he could just focus on his 30 guys. He was awesome. You put him in front of the entire team. He has to manage the staff. He has to manage the offense in terms of, you know, confidence and talk to them and call the defense. Overwhelmed. I think you see this with Todd Bowles. When Todd Bowles has been allowed to be the coordinator for Arians, he dominates. But when he becomes the head coach, the final play call, which ultimately, you know, essentially ended the game, he blitzes the nickel corner on like third and three or third and four. It's like, Todd, that guy's never going to get home. Easy pass, Josh Allen to Diggs. And listen, Todd Bowles is a guy known to blitz a lot. That's kind of his calling card. He's like a Wink Martindale. Very blitz heavy guy. There's nothing wrong with that if that's your style. But that blitz at that time when their star wide receivers right there, to me, was idiotic. And that speaks to a guy who's a number two put in the number one spot. Everything from there gets diminished. And I think you're seeing Todd Bowles, you know, he's obviously not that great of a head coach, but his great skill as a coordinator is not as strong when he's also the head coach. So I think his job status is clearly, as they keep losing, because I got news for you, they're going to keep losing. The other thing is, when you lose a lot, your offense is terrible. It's one thing if you're in a division with several 12 or 13 win teams. They're in the worst division in football. Saints stink. Uh, Falcons stink. It, it, it's not. A, it's just not a good division. So uh, I, I think the Bucks are not shouldn't just be open for business. I, I think they should pull the trigger and get rid of a ton of guys follow what the Titans are doing, and just reset your franchise. I have no problem with everything they did for the last several years, but it's time. And you can see it on full display with Baker Mayfield as your quarterback. NBA fans, the wait is over. Basketball is back, and DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA, is celebrating with an unbeatable offer. New customers can score $200 instantly 
in bonus bets for throwing down $5 on the NBA. Win or lose, it doesn't matter. You'll start the season with an instant dub. And with DraftKings parlays, everyone's got a shot at even bigger basketball wins. String together multiple bets from the same game or build your parlay across multiple games for a shot and making your payday even sweeter. Basketball is more fun when you're in on the action. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code JOHN. New customers can get $200 in bonus bets instantly for betting just $5. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code JOHN. The crown is yours. And speaking about teams that should reset, is a lot of times, you know, in football, this is not the NBA where you start tanking basically immediately. I mean, Greg Popovich, who never shuts up, tanked for like three straight years. And he's always screaming about the integrity of the game. Like he, he's a sneaky king tanker. He's just not as outspoken about it as a guy like Sam Hinkie was. But he's done it several times throughout his career in multiple decades. In the NFL, being a head coach is too valuable. It's too financially uh, lucrative for these guys. They fight for every inch. As a player, no guaranteed contracts. All you have on your resume is what you put on tape. So every team tries whether you're good or bad. So no one truly tanks. Hell, Stephen Ross, which I don't blame him, told Brian Flores, I'll give you money under the table. Just lose games. And he beat the Bengals, and it cost them Joe Burrow. Now, ultimately, in a weird way, it's kind of worked out, but not for him. He got run out of town, and now McDaniel somewhat reaps the rewards, I guess. But there are several teams to me that if they lose on Sunday, have to acknowledge, like, it's it's time to get rid of some veterans and try to obviously use and develop some younger players. But we need to be open for business. To me, the Patriots, the Vikings, the Packers, obviously the Vikings and the Packers play each other, Washington, the Giants, the Chargers, any of these teams, if they lose, especially the Chargers. Like, if you lose on Sunday night to this second or Division II quarterback and your season is just done, because that's what it would be, it would be officially done, like, how about you start taking some calls? And if you're Dean Spanos, you hit the blow-up button, maybe you fire the coach, but you trade the players, and you kind of reset this for the next guy coming in this offseason. You give them more draft capital. You already got the quarterback on board, and, and you try to rebuild this team. Same thing with the Giants. Listen, Brian Dayball has shown a lot of grittiness this last couple weeks, right? They took the Bills right down to the wire. They, they won last week. You know, they've done that with Tyrod Taylor. I saw... I. He, he, I guess he wouldn't have talked on Thursday, but it was either on Wednesday. It, yeah, probably was Wednesday where he said he stopped. I think Jordan Renan asked him in the press conference. He, he said, did you say something to Saquon Barkley? He said he grabbed Saquon Barkley and told him we don't intend to trade you. Like we have no intention of trading you. I, I know the rumors are out there. I think they should if they get a good offer. I, I'm not saying give them away, but you lose this weekend. Like you wouldn't trade them to the Bills for like a second round pick. I'm not saying the Bills would do that, but you got to be open to these ideas. You're going nowhere. Is Saquon going to be on your team in two or three years? Newsflash, probably not. Uh, so you you just weren't giving him a long-term extension now. So if you can get the proper value for a guy who now makes a lot of money, who you are very hesitant to give a long-term contract, you have to be open-minded to the idea. Uh, obviously, the commanders in a weird spot. Coach feels like he's kind of coaching for their, his job. Though some you know, of these, uh, I think I've heard, was it Diana Rossini or her, one of the NFL newsbreakers that think some people believe that Ron Rivera thinks that because Josh Harris had to leverage so much money to buy this franchise that he's not just flush with cash to buy his staff out and then hire a new staff. So who knows? But regardless, if I'm the owner, we lose this weekend, like trade whoever you want to trade. Let's get some picks. Obviously the losers of the Vikings Packer game. I mean, they're going nowhere fast. The Vikings, even if they were to win, they've already kind of acknowledged cutting all the guys this offseason. They're not going to re-sign Kirk Cousins, you don't think. Like, why wouldn't you be open for business? You're, you're not, like, winning a playoff game. I know it was fun on Monday night, but that's probably the peak of your season. Now, the thing with the Patriots is, like, who do they really have to trade at this point? Uh, but, you know, if anyone gives them an offer or anybody and you lose this week to the Dolphins, like, send them packing. And that speaks to some of the pressure on the quarterbacks this weekend. I think there are guys that are kind of under the microscope. And, and one guy, and listen, I defend him because I think he's awesome. 
and I feel comfortable defending. I think he's a really good player. Now, is he accomplished? Like win an MVP like Lamar, win a Super Bowls like Patrick Mahomes, or even consistently winning like Josh Allen? No, he's not. Would every team in the league beside like 27 teams, or excuse me, 27 of the 32 teams want this guy as their quarterback? Yes, that's Justin Herbert. But Sunday night, despite a coach who has no clue what he's doing, despite a bunch of injuries, despite a defense that can't stop a soul, like you kind of need to come out and eviscerate the Chicago Bears. Like that's, that kind of needs to happen. Now, I understand you playing in a, in a venue that's going to be 75% West Coast Chicago Bears fans, but you just got to do something. I, I think there is tangible pressure on Justin Herbert to not just have a good game, but a little like Josh Allen the night, just have a game like we're not fucking losing. Uh, <laughs> under no set circumstances on my watch are we losing this game. And, you know, kind of need that to happen. The other guy is he doesn't quite make as much as Herbert, but they gave him a lot of money this offseason. And as you saw tonight, the Bucks stink. I, I think the Falcons stink. I mean, they have good individual players, but as a team, I, I'm just not buying it. Like, no chance. The Carolina Panthers can't win a game to save their life. The Saints paid all this money for Derek Carr. They were not expecting Mahomes, Josh Allen, and Lamar Jackson. They were just expecting someone to play like the 12th or 13th quarterback in the league, which he has done at times in his career. And then this week, you know, JT O'Sullivan, former NFL quarterback, played at UC Davis, actually. Funny story, when he was in college, he pretended – to be doing like a charity drive where he was accepting money. Turns out it was a fake charity. He was drunk, but that's a, that's a long time ago now, but he runs a successful YouTube channel where he breaks down quarterback play. And I think he was very, very critical on the video. Uh, It would have been what last Thursday against cars game against the Jags. And rightfully so like Derek has consistently for what they paid him and what they expected been pretty awful. You know, you're playing the Colts who have shown some life, but their, their number four pick is on injured reserve with a sling on his arm. They've got Gardner Minshew. You, you got to make some plays indoors. Like th- Part of the reason, and I, I'm kicking myself for doing this because ultimately their coach is Dennis Allen and Derek. Like That's not a great combination. But everyone that was bullish on the Saints, like myself, we just went through their schedule. It's like bad quarterback, bad quarterback, rookie quarterback, bad quarterback. There weren't many Tom Brady's and Peyton Manning's on that schedule. Yet all of a sudden you lose this game, you're three and five, and you're a joke. So I I, I think there is tangible pressure on Derek Carr. And uh, it's easy for him to say, well, you expect me to answer a question in a press conference about a you know journeyman quarterback? Give me a break. No, Derek, I, I think the guy had some valid points. Like it, it was very fair you're playing poorly. For a limited time, Verizon customers can get Netflix and NFL Plus for just $25 a month with plus play that's $120 in annual savings plus play is a platform where Verizon customers can shop manage and save on the descriptions you already love like Netflix and NFL plus with NFL plus premium you get access to live games on mobile NFL red zone NFL network and more just go to verizon.com slash plus play to bundle and save on Netflix and NFL Plus today for a limited time only. I saw Kurt Warner online was coming to the defense of Jordan Love that said when you went through the all 22, that where what was he supposed to do with the ball? And so basically what he's saying is it's more on the play caller. Here's what I would say. You don't need to be Bill Walsh or Shane Steichen or Sean McVay meets Kyle Shanahan, to sit on your couch for three or four weeks and just go, yeah, this guy feels a little overwhelmed. And that's what it's consistently felt like with Jordan Love. Can you break down every route concept and hot route and everything that's going right and wrong on the offense from your couch? Of course not. Even if you or me get the all 22, do I know their offense, everyone's what they're supposed to do and what they're not supposed to do? No, you don't unless you have the playbook. But I think it's pretty clear the last several weeks that Jordan has been a little overwhelmed. And like I said, I think to Colin on Sunday night, and I've been saying this from the beginning, the moment they signed him to that contract extension and did not give him the fifth-year option, it told you what they thought about him. It also was an incredible contingency plan 
if it doesn't work out, we get a guy, we can move back to backup quarterback, or even if it gets really weird, we have to not keep him around. We're not even paying him that much money. So they're not even screwed. But if this guy wants to continue to start, like he's going to have to start making some plays. So he's home off a bye, playing Minnesota. Like, come on, bro. Like, let's make some plays. And uh, I, I don't know, man. I, I guess he's not off a bye. He was off a bye last week, didn't play that well. But he's well-rested, got guys coming back from injury. Uh, I'm just, can Jordan Love show me anything? Because I wanted to like him, right? Mobility, big arm strength, but you got to be able to play the position. And right now you watch Jordan Love, you're like, eh, I don't really see it. And last but not least, listen, I've been critical of this guy simply because uh, I've said it forever that the Mac Jones, the Kenny Pickett's are guys I would take in the third round. And I talked to a guy that runs a college draft, like a college scouting director. And he's like, you know, the problem with that, that mindset is what is ultimately the difference if you're going to take a guy in the second or third round at quarterback? Because you're ultimately kind of staying, you could see this guy being your starter. So if you're going to take, what's the difference of taking the guy at the end of the second round or at pick 22 or at pick 15? The difference is when you trade up to get a guy. But if you let the guy fall to you and you view him as a starter, even if you acknowledge in the draft room, yeah, listen, his ceiling is not what these other guys are, but we need a quarterback and we view him as a starter, there's not much difference. Now, there's a little difference in terms of the financial impact, but where I do agree is like that guy, if you're willing to take him at 15 or 20, and I view historically that guy as a third-round talent, in that individual draft, that player is not going to be there in the third round. So you have to, if you really need the quarterback, take him at 15, 20, is understandable. I disagree with it. I wouldn't do it. Uh, more Mac than Kenny Pickett because of the players around Kenny Pickett. But I, I do understand the logic when you need a quarterback, and clearly the Steelers and you know the Patriots need a quarterback. Well, Mac Jones last week was just much better, right? Their offense, clearly their offensive line, got some guys back off injury, made some moves, was much better. Uh, he's better under center. He's more comfortable when you get rid of the ball quickly. Early on, and last year when he was falling apart, and early on this year, what bothers me about players that have limited skill sets is when they try to play like Jalen Hurts or Josh Allen. And they run, Baker does this sometimes. And they like run around behind the pocket like they are Russell Wilson in his prime. It's like, bro, this is not your game. You might make a play one time, scrambling around, doing a 360, getting out of the pocket, throwing it downfield. But more often than not, with your skill set, it's going to lead to disaster. It's going to lead to an interception. It's going to lead to you getting sacked. It's going to be a negative play. That play consistently, when you keep going back to it, even if other people fucked up, even if your offensive line got lit up, even if the receiver ran the route, wrong route, just hit the ground. Live to play another down. That's how you have to play. You have to play very, very conservatively. Josh Allen, the Jalen Hurts, the Patrick Mahomes, because of their skill set, they can play outside the pocket. Think about it like Peyton Manning and Tom Brady. Two guys, greatest quarterback ever, another guy in the top five. They never played outside the pocket because they knew only bad things could happen, right? That that's, wasn't their game. So when other people screwed up and they couldn't get rid of the ball, they would just hit the ground. And they'd just wave the white flag. The problem with a guy like Mac is he's slightly athletic enough, to, and you see it with Baker, to kind of take off. But more often than not, that's when problems you know, arise because that is not their game. And I think you just got to keep Mac Jones in the pocket, get the ball out of the quick. And if it's not there, Mac, go down, throw the ball away. That is the only way we're going to be able to function as a team. We clearly are not explosive enough to score 35 points. You're not a good enough player to just run around and make shit happen. Play in the construct of the offense. And if other people outside of you are screwing up, not open, you know, free rushers, just go down. That's fine. We'll take a loss. I'd rather take a three-yard loss than you throw a pick six or you throw the ball to the other team. Because when the Patriots were getting mollywopped by teams like the Saints, that's what he was doing. He was just trying to play outside of his own skill set. So if Bill O'Brien and Belichick could just get him back, you know, contained, it, that game's kind of interesting. Uh, now, Tyreek, I saw today, says he's going to play this week. Uh, with was a hamstring or hip injury. Uh, clearly, he's you know one of the most dominant players in the NFL. So him being in or out is, is a really big deal. But we talked about this last week with the Patriots. 
don't love them against random teams. Like if you told me next week they're playing the Jags or they're playing Seattle at Seattle, it's like, do not like that matchup. But those six games against the AFC East, you got to like their chances. You, you really do. He knows these players. He knows their skill set. Uh, I mean, look at when they played the Dolphins, who early on in the season were lighting everyone up like a Christmas tree. Belichick had a chance to win. And to me, it gets back to familiarity and just his coaching and understanding of the three teams that he plays, you know, total times six times a year. And it's not just when he plays the Dolphins, when he plays the Bills and he's getting ready for the Bills, he's watching Dolphins tape to get re- that, that game. So you see all the cross tape, your knowledge of those players. I say it all the time, all these divisional games. I don't care if it's like the seven and one Eagles against the winless commanders or you know, the the five and one Seattle against the winless Arizona. Those players, the the comfort level they have, the schemes, the carryover, even as new coaches come and go, a lot of the players are the same. There's not an intimidation factor. So I think with division games, things get weird and things get weird very fast. So I'm I'm very fascinated to watch those quarterbacks. Uh, a, a couple other, obviously the Browns thing has gotten pretty weird. You know, he says he's hurt. It feels like the Browns kind of say he's hurt, but also don't want to say it, but they also don't totally agree with everything. Bizarre situation. They have, they're going to Seattle. Seattle wins, and if it turns out Sam Darnold has to play, all of a sudden Seattle, you know, the Niners would have lost three straight games, and Seattle would be in first place in the NFC West. Think how crazy that would be. Now, I, I still think the Niners, there's going to be a kitchen sink game. Kyle Shanahan threw his defensive coordinator under the bus this week, even though what the defensive coordinator did was dumb. You just don't often see coaches publicly say like, yeah, that was a stupid call about their coordinator, especially with a new coordinator. And my theory simple is I I do wonder if some of the star players on the Niners, Fred Warner, Nick Bosa, Ward, are not really feeling this. Like they've been with D'Amico the last couple of years. They know what elite game plans are. And this guy's game plans are a little different than what they're used to. So if he kind of just publicly did that to kind of show his locker room, like, yeah, I'm not cool with it either. Even though I hired this guy and even though I'm the boss in any moment over the headset, I can say do something else. But a little bit of a bizarre situation. The Niners, even when things are going good, things always get a little weird uh, with Kyle and this team. Now you're getting Sam Darnold. So, you know, Bengals coming off a bye. Jamar Chase is 50 catches right now. 50 catches. They played six games. So, I mean, do, do the math. Like, he's he's on pace for a lot of receptions this year. Jordan Addison just lit up the Niners. That's going to be interesting. And, all you know, Seattle, thing with Cleveland is two weeks ago they won with P.J. Walker holding on for dear life against the Niners. I mean, he could have thrown, like, five picks. Last week he essentially started because Deshaun got hurt early on in that game. And same type deal, they held on for dear life. Now he's starting again from, from the from the jump in this game. Are you going to win three straight games with P.J. Walker playing the majority of the snaps at quarterback? It feels like it's going to be difficult, especially two road games. So this is a spot for Cleveland. They win this game. You have to wonder, like, would they sniff around some upgrades at quarterback given that Deshaun, who knows his situation with his shoulder? So because their team, you, you win this game, you, you go 3-0 and with P.J. Walker? I mean, that's, that's an incredible accomplishment. I, I don't think... I wonder if there's another team. Like The Niners couldn't do it. The Eagles maybe could do it if they just ran it every play with DeAndre Swift. But even that would be hard. Like What, what Cleveland is doing right now with P.J. Walkers, you win this game, just I think you got to trade for a quarterback. Uh, and, and last but not least, a story. Well, I want to give uh, congratulations to Sean McVay. He had a baby today, uh, Jordan McVay. So congrats to the McVay family. As he said a couple weeks ago, my son knows better. He will not be born on game day. And he was right. He was born in the middle of the week. Sean will be coaching in Dallas. Uh, tricky game, too. It's a little bit like, uh, you know, those 9 a.m. kickoffs for us on the West Coast. Like when Colorado early on the season kicked off at 9 a.m. with USC. That body clock game, it's it's tough. And the Rams, how often do the Cowboys play a 10 a.m. game at, at home? I get You know, 12, 12 o'clock their time. But that Rams going on the road, 10 a.m. body clock, but it's not on the East Coast. Kind of a bizarre deal. T- tough spot for the Rams for sure, especially with Sean, who I would imagine has been in and out of the office all week. 
But there was a college football reporter broke a story today that that TCU got word of uh, the Michigan ch- cheating scandal feels a little strong uh, sign scandal that they steal your signs and they go to your games. Even though I understand when in a conference game, when you do it because you know all your opponents, I would imagine it would have been a little more difficult with uh, some of these playoff opponents Though I guess the Marine guy could have sent someone to the Big 12 championship game, which I would imagine they did uh, once they kind of got an idea of who they could play in the playoff game once they beat Ohio State. But TCU, and I would imagine it was Sonny Dykes or one of the coordinators, leaked that they got word that Michigan was going to have all their signs. So what they did is all the signs they used, they just made them all dummy signs. And they changed them all but they still used them on game day and they told all their players, none of them work, but we're just going to do it like we normally do look at it like you normally would, but they're all fake. And I went to the box score. It's not like Max Duggan or whoever threw for 700 yards, but they did lose 41 to 40 or 51 to 45. And I do wonder if that's true. Like I understand if you have the signs, why you would utilize them against Penn state against Wisconsin, against Ohio state. But Michigan, as you saw in the national championship game, I'm not saying they should have won the game 70-7 to or whatever Georgia beat TCU. But if you play that game, Michigan, and no one has any plays or signs, Michigan should win that game eight or nine out of ten times. And I wonder if that the way they were going about the sign stuff fucked them up in that game. Because you, you shouldn't need the signs to run Sonny Dykes spread offense when you have better players at every position. And I wonder if that's something that Jim Harbaugh is thinking about, like, especially after he lost. Like, did we overthink that one? Just play the freaking game against that guy. I understand stealing the signs against Georgia. I understand stealing the signs against Ohio State. You're going to need those advantages to beat those teams. But against TCU, and I'm not diminishing anything TCU did last year. Incredible accomplishment, and that's an unreal win against Michigan. But I wonder if Michigan almost slowed themselves down, being so obsessed with the signs uh, against an opponent that they were a heavy favorite. And I also wonder where this is going to go because every day kind of a new story breaks. Uh, I, you know, he's going to keep playing these games is, is going to get vacated in a year. He probably won't even be in college football, but this is just a story that keeps on giving. And I, I can't lie while I don't think, you know, I said my piece earlier this week on the sign stealing, it is entertaining all the different angles that keep coming out. Okay, last but not least, bold take of the week. Brought to you by my friends at Guinness. And early on, I was getting really aggressive. I was trying to pick games that, hoping to hit a huge underdog. And you realize that's going to happen once in a blue moon. Last week, I got to give myself some credit. I said that someone was going to get fired in the NFL. And Frank Reich essentially fired himself, demoted himself, and made his offense made the offensive coordinator gave him the play calling. He was no longer the play caller. This week I looked at the slate like it was. I don't love the Patriots to beat the Dolphins. I didn't love any huge upsets. There aren't many crazy games in college that I felt good about. I do think with the amount of teams in the NFL starting to realize, yeah, we we're not that good. And once that this weekend happens and some of these kind of five hundred teams are three and four but also kind of feel lifeless. I wonder if they wave the white flag. Really good quarterback draft, really good draft in general. And when I say white flag, they'd still try, but just be really open to trade veteran players. And I I think we're going to see last year, it was a little earlier than the trade deadline. McCaffrey got traded. We've seen Von Miller got traded. It's been a couple years since we've seen the big, a number one for a player. I think we see a first round pick traded over the next four or five days for a player. I don't know who. I also think there's a chance for there to be some players. We're talking about Mike Evans. We're talking about Chris Godwin. We're talking about the same names on a lot of the teams that we see. Are we sure there couldn't be a sleeper name? There are some guys making enormous contracts in the NFL. You know, the Rams are a good example. Would they just entertain you lose this week to Dallas all of a sudden you realize, yeah, we're probably not a playoff team. Could we get like a one and two twos for Aaron Donald, a guy who's getting up there in age, makes a ton of money? 
And I'm not advocating, like, I wouldn't want to trade him either. But you got to think big picture. And this is part of being a GM. Everything we did before worked. We blew all these picks on players, and it netted us a ton of playoff victories and obviously a Super Bowl championship. And I'm just using them as an example. But those type players, pro ball, all pro level players, on teams going nowhere. And on teams who are just more likely to reset over the next 12, 18 months than to be in the Super Bowl contention window. So I I expect definitely a first-round pick to get thrown around uh, on Monday or Tuesday, and honestly, maybe more. So that's my bold take of the week, brought to you by Guinness. Gather your friends, raise your glasses, and toast to a win. Guinness Drought Stout, imported by Diageo Beer Company, USA, New York, New York. Please drink responsibly.